All right, hello everybody. Pastor Mac here with uh, a few of the great people um, that's involved in this beautiful city that we all love, that's near and dear to our heart, Thomasville, North Carolina. Chair City is what they call us. Um, I'm excited to come to you guys for um, uh, this tough conversation. Um, there's a lot going on in our world, and what better way than now for us to address it, bring it to the forefront. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that we can use this platform of Zoom and technology. Although we are in, in the middle of a pandemic, we can still come together um, through Zoom and virtually to uh, just discuss and have this tough conversation. So um, I'm thankful for those who are logging in, who have logged in, um, share, like, call a friend, text a friend, let them know um, that the city of Thomasville is doing their part. Um, our goal here is not to uh, make this a sprint because we believe this is a marathon, but if we can start having some conversations, um, then hopefully we can get some answers and we can get some direction and we can get some action. Um, and that is our goal. So I'm thankful to each one of these individuals that are represented here today. As they begin to answer our questions, um, they will um, um, let you know who they are. Some of you may know them, some of you may not, um, but you have the opportunity to know who they are today. So I'm thankful for our moderators, um, Ms. Uh, Shelly Skeen and uh, Mr. Andrew Watkins, who will be facilitating our discussion today. Feel free to throw some questions and comments in the chat as well. Um, and we plan to have a series of these, um, if not every week um, or a couple of times a week, um, definitely coming to you guys with the, um, the state of our community and our city that we love. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Shelly at this time and allow her to uh, start our discussion. Yes, thank you so much, Pastor Mac Mayor, Pastor McNair. Thank you so much. And um, welcome again to everyone viewing. We want to, of course, welcome our panelists. And we want to say to you that we want to um, definitely allow your voice to be heard. This will be in a round robin style. And as a moderator today, again, as Shelly Skeen here in the community, um, I want to make sure that we start out with the foundation. And that foundation are clear definitions of two words that we just want to put out front, if you will, racism, racism. The definition of racism is the belief that all members of each race possesses characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or or superior to another race or races. And then the second word is systematic, systematic. Anything done or acting according to a fixed plan, methodically, a fixed plan in a methodical way, if you will. And so with those two definitions in mind, we want to start out tonight, again, posing each question to each speaker who was here with us tonight. Again, this is not a global, necessarily a global conversation, but myself and Mr. Andrew Watkins, we want to speak specifically to the answers that concern the city of Thomasville. Andrew, if you would, we can start with the first question. All right, so let's let's hop in again. Um, the, the floor is open to whoever uh, on the panel may want to answer um, the each each given question. Um, so the first, well, actually, to add a a, a small wrinkle, um, if if you do uh, elect to answer at least on the first uh, round, tell us who you are. Um, I know folks are looking and reading um, via the, the Zoom conversation, but it'd be, be awesome if um, y'all could just take a quick second to introduce yourself and then go for it with uh, whatever answer that you would like to offer for the given question. So first question is, 
give one example of how systemic racism has impacted your life in Townsville. I'd like to take that one first, if it's okay. Okay, so uh, first to introduce myself. My name is Marlene Martinez. I'm currently a political science major at Winston-Salem State University. I'm a senior, um, but I, was, uh, I wasn't born in Thomasville, but I've grown up in Thomasville. And so, you know, um, I have really strong ties to my community and, you know, I'm, I'm constantly here in the city. And well, to go ahead and answer your question, I think that most of us, the first time that we come into um, contact with systematic racism is when we hit the school systems. So if we just take a look at our city of Thomasville, we have two separate school systems. We have Davidson County Schools and we have Thomasville City Schools. And if you look at Davidson County Schools, Davidson County Schools are predominantly white. And Thomasville City Schools is where you see more people of color and you see diverse diversity within um, you know, the students. And within those two school systems, we see um, issues with funding, you know, one system gets um, more funding than the other. We see a lot of issues within resources. And I guess the, the main point that I'd like to make tonight um, is that a lot of the times we think that these are issues going on across the country, but we fail to see that they're issues that we have right here at home in Thomasville. You know, me as, as a part of the Latinx community here in Thomasville, I've had countless times where I've had to stand up for other community members. Uh, I remember one time in specific, I was at the DMV and this lady was trying to explain to um, the employee there that her prefix was different because of her Mexican um, birth certificate. And um, there were community members just sitting there mocking her, you know, because of her accent. And we're talking about an elderly lady here who's trying to speak English. And the man himself was giving her a hard time. I mean, being really, really loud about it. And as soon as I stepped up from the corner, the whole tone changed. And I made sure that they knew like, hey, this is not okay. You cannot sit here and mock her. She's trying to communicate with you, you know? And that's just like one of the many instances that I've had here countless times where I've heard, you know, like racial slurs or like, people, you know, that have, that are employed within the actual community, you know, like, we see this stuff, it's here at home, it's a problem here, and we can't just keep acting like it's not, so. So the education system has definitely, or at least between our two uh, panelists that have spoken, been uh, a top um, area where systematic racism has presented itself. Uh, I also um, point out uh, within our, uh, and this is directly connected to the schools, but also um, employment opportunities um, in the city. Uh, there is a, um, I guess a, I guess I could call it a uh, unspoken reality when it comes to the employment of specific individuals and what we see oftentimes um, is family members who are hired for positions as opposed to the most qualified candidate. Um, and oftentimes um, that negatively impacts minority candidates in the community. Um, and, and, um, it's something that I think deserves more um, discussion because uh, it, it has happened, and this is anecdotal based on conversations that I've had with several individuals and even my own experiences. Um, but I think because um, there is this underlying acceptance of uh, the, the inequality between um, minority folks uh, and white folks in the community, then the bias can easily um, find itself uh, perpetuated uh, in several different um, arenas in, in our city. Um, and so it's absolutely something that um, is worth, worth discussion. Anyone else want to talk a little bit about question one? Um, do we have Jacquez back? I am back. Sorry about that. My phone overheated. You're good. Uh, so going back again, my name is Jacquez Johnson. Um, talking about already Davidson County has a system that is already built 
from age five from our students uh, who go into these school systems, whether it's uh, Thomasville City, Davidson County, who are already lacking a key development tool when you're wanting to um, grow up and understand the complexities of the world, and that's diversity. And with Thomasville City School, we don't lack that as much, but when you see students that are go to uh, Davidson County Schools that are residents here in Thomasville, and you see the, the vast differences between diversity inside of Thompson City Schools and then in Davidson County Schools. While it's not an issue that we can directly uh, change here as city leaders, it is something that we could put pressure on in our city elected, uh, our statewide elected officials to make some really strong changes in our school system to see what would best benefit our students here in Thomasville. Um, because we really need to look at this situation because students here in Thomasville are being disproportionate um, at a, a Product, products of a system that is designed to hold us back. So that's one of the biggest ways that I've seen as um, so systematic racism has affected myself as a student who was graduated from Thomasville High School. So um, I would I would like to move question one back to a broader example because what I realized as they were answering systematic racism in Thomasville also can as we make the comparison to um, the Davidson County Schools versus the city schools, um, I would like to move that question around in a different from a different angle and just simply ask about how have you experienced since we do have another four or five people here on our um, line, how have you um, seen an example of systematic racism possibly affect you? whether you operate or own a business in Thomas Field, because that is going to move us through and segue uh, pretty good through the rest of our questions. But have you seen systematic racism impact you as an employee, an employer, business owner, or in some other way? So let's not, we don't want to uh, leave you out and make, we want to uh, achieve a robust conversation here. Um, so that's for um, Pastor Jimmy Granger, Sheraton, Love, um, Jane Murphy, and who else is here? Michael Brandt. Again, Michael Brandt, we do know that you um, are not from Thomasville, but if you all want to answer it from that regard or perspective, we want to open that up to you right now. Heard me. So I'm Sheraton Love, a member of the Thomasville City Schools Board of Education, um, and I'm also on several local um, community boards like CIS, things like that. So what I wanted to say, Shelly, in response to your question um, are just broad things for us to think about when you're thinking about systemic racism. Um, are there a smaller proportion of black owned businesses, which, uh, you know, there are resources to make sure that there are minority owned businesses in cities? Um, is that not happening? Do you see a pattern of banks not helping um, people of color own their homes as opposed to having rentals? So I think that that's things for communities to start to think about, or particularly community leaders. What, what is the equity imbalance, if there is one, um, related to making sure that people of color are getting the resources that they need to really be um, economically at an advantage for their families? And that looks like things like you're saying, like having an opportunity to have employment to support their families, owning their homes instead of renting. So I think those are some things to think about when you're thinking about systemic racism and how we can um, bring about positive change. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheraton. Love, we do appreciate that. Um, Dr. J, I mean, um, Mr. Michael Brandt, yay or nay, are you going to pass on that if you have anything else to say so I can get right directly to question? Yeah, I, I, I really feel like I can't speak to it. Uh, I, I recognize that, that I am not usually the uh, brunt of racism and have come to appreciate that there is some uh, systematic racism in many forms uh, by uh, uh, intentional and unintentional that occur, but it, uh, I don't feel like I have a, a voice on that particular issue. Thank you. Shelly? Yes. I'm Jackie Jackson. Yes. A former member of city council here in Thomasville. And um, I just want to speak on it kind of briefly and maybe from a broad perspective, as you suggested, um, be, previously being on city council, there have been times where I felt like I had to be the voice um, for us in the community because 
either um, my counterparts and some of the policymakers may not have been completely in tune with some of the decisions that we were making that may impact our, our neighborhoods and our specific communities. Um, a lot of times in um, recommending or suggesting people for um, committees, commissions, and board seats, um, being that voice to make sure that someone from our community is being represented. Um, a lot of times we're overlooked. So in that area, I can say um, that probably has been um, the most um, beneficial. I can say that I try to help in that from a city perspective and a city leader perspective, just trying to make sure that we are represented and we have a seat at the table because that's a lot of times the, the problem. We're not at the table when those decisions are being made and, and being that voice. Racism can also happen from, again, the Hispanic Latino community giving and receive the black community giving and receiving, be it that racist, prejudice, discriminatory, and let's bunch all of those together, um, experiences. And it may be neither from within in a personal level, meaning I may not be the one experiencing as Jackie Jackson brought up racism or feeling as if it's impacted me directly, but I may have very well had certain situations, which I have, that Marlena, Marlena brought up, where I've had to defend also and come to the defense for one of our Hispanic community members in Atlanta, Georgia. And there it was something that I saw and hence I understood that was systematic racism. So it impacted me, but I was helping not another member of the black community, but the Hispanic community. And we want you to understand that again, this conversation must remain broad and global because it is not just white, our white community giving, issuing, and uh, victimizing the, any other community. So I want to be very clear that we have a healthy and a robust conversation. Thank you all so much. And you all added to the fact that brought that to the forefront for me. So thank you all so much. Um, question number two, what forms of activism or advocacy do you think would be helpful to see a change take place or what do you would what you would want to see whether you think it would be helpful or not what would you like to see in forms of advocacy or activism take place in Thomasville again specifically and let's start I'm going to call you name by name so that we can make sure we get a good um, transition here Let's go ahead and start with um, Jane Murphy. Let's let's start with you. Okay, I'm Jane Murphy, and I'm um, serve on the Thomasville City Council. I hope that we will continue to have more of these conversations. Um, just as Pastor McNair had said at the beginning, when there are issues, we often come together about the immediate issue, and as time goes on, we seem to lose momentum but I hope that this has grabbed us enough that we will continue to have these conversations. Actually, from the conversation we had this past Sunday night, there were numerous things that were brought to my attention to make me aware. Um, one in particular was simply just asking my um, friends of color how they're doing through this whole situation, not trying to avoid the conversation, but reaching out and saying, hey, how are things going? Um, and that's been very eye-opening for me, for being the white male, I haven't, ex I mean, the white female, <laughs> having had to experience some of the things that some of my friends have experienced. And it's, um, I want to know more. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Pastor Jimmy Granger, would you please go next? Yeah, uh, Jimmy Granger, pastor of the Orchard Church here in Thomasville. Uh, I agree. It's just having more conversations like this, um, but on a broader scale where it's either um, televised on the Thomasville channel, uh, whether it's uh, um, more involved in churches. For me, it's, it's continuing to have black pastors come into my church and to be able to speak on these on the issues that are affecting their community. Um, I think for especially as a white pastor that 
getting to the place too for in other pastors too in our city that it's just not a black issue it is a city issue uh, it is a heart issue that we all got to deal with so what issues affect you as a, as a person as an individual what makes what makes you you it should affect me also um i just think more conversations like this on a broader scale more churches getting involved Yes, my name is Michael Brandt. I'm the Assistant City Manager for the City of Thomasville. And I, I do believe that there is a, an opportunity, uh, as was mentioned earlier by uh, Mrs. Jackson, about getting more uh, minority candidates on our boards and committees. Um, and you know, that, the, the idea is to get the voice of the community. And if not everyone is represented in those committees, then, then not every voice is being heard. So I do believe that that's a place where the city can work with uh, uh, various committees and communities to make sure that we get uh, a broader range of appointments uh, for all of our committees. And um, you know, it, it would help to diversify and bring those voices forward. Um, and the reality is, is that many times committee membership is what enters the, the arena into the political world and gives people the confidence to then make a decision to run for city council or other uh, political bodies. And that's where the other change can happen. So I think it's important to start with those committee appointments and making sure that they, they are broad based. So I think activism and advocacy have to be linked to uh, someone's personal mission. Um, and I think in this day and age, we all want to be involved and, and help uh, bring positive change to our community. Sometimes it can feel overwhelming to know where to start. But what is, that, um, what is that passion that you have? Is it in education? Um, well, there are lots of different boards that you can be involved in. Um, you know, even with Thomasville City Schools, which we've talked about a lot, there's a parent board, there's a community board, there's a student board, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear from our students on the call um, and, and them talking very passionately about um, examples of how we can you know, move forward together as a community. So, so figure out what that is if you're a business owner, you know, can you make sure you either lift up a voice as a person of color or make sure, like uh, Michael said, that we have the right representation um, on different city boards. Um, so, so start with what you know and what you love and try to seek out avenues in those forms of advocacy so that you can make sure that we're all um, coming to the table in different avenues. Another way I think that we can do uh, a lot of, a better job at uh, activism and advocacy is by uh, creating a, a space as community leaders and as individuals, uh, as citizens in the ci uh, city, creating a space of where people feel welcome, um, a, a place of uh, inclusivity, and making sure that uh, when we see something that might be um, divisive or uh, racial or discriminatory, we're speaking up about that. Um, because we all know that our silence is dangerous. And when we're not speaking up about those issues, we're making it a lot harder for people who really want progression in this city to get to that point to where we need. So speaking up when we see something and not being afraid so much of uh, maybe a reelection campaign or uh, getting into this position, but also being a, the strongest advocate that we can when we're in these positions of power to make sure that we're really moving our community forward and making sure that everybody feels that they have a voice in this community. So always speaking up and never being afraid to shy down to uh, a fight is the best way I think we can truly um, advocate best for our city and um, be the best activists here um, with moving our city forward. So. Thank you so much, Jacquez, and we appreciate everyone's uh, very candid responses as we want to welcome you all to be just that. Um, a lot of you hold your particular positions. Dr. Tanisha Watkins, I don't know how I have skipped over you and I do apologize. Let's definitely get your input, please. Dr. Tanisha Watkins, thank you. Thank you. Um, so when talking about what can we do in Thomasville, I think one of the key things that I would like to see is just better organization. Yes, we have all of these different boards that people may join. Um, however, we need a specific board, right, or a coalition or a task force 
um, that is looking specific uh, that is looking specifically at ways that we can dismantle, you know, this uh, uh, systematic racism that we may see um, within the city. And so I think one thing that we need to do is identify the voices that we trust and then two, we need to consistently bring those people together so that not only are we listening, but we are taking um, that feedback from the community and we're using it in strategic and actionable ways. Um, and I think that we need to recognize that the work that we're trying to do um, is, is going to take a long time. Um, and so in order to have substantial change, we need to make sure that we have that we're documenting our processes and that we have certain goals outlined that we want to achieve. I think one of my biggest frustrations with what I'm kind of seeing happening right now is that there are a lot of people who want to help, but what do they want to help do? And so when I analyze like the 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 protests that, that are going on, yes, we're raising awareness about police brutality, but where do we go next? And so it's going to be important that we have these coalitions that come together and that can um, really have some measurable outcomes that they want to achieve. Yes, thank you so much for your input. And that's absolutely in the great segue uh, with where I was going to just wrap up that question. As I pass it on and prepare to pass on question number three to um, back to Pastor Andrew, uh, documentation, education, and protection. Uh, 25 years in human resources, uh, focusing on policy. Uh, it has been, well, how about procedure, policy procedure, and compliance? When you have those three things, which of course are all three different elements, when you have advocacy rising up or needing to be implemented or reformed, reform meaning you have something currently that needs to be improved upon, or you're implementing new ideas, I am saying that I, I believe in all that what we've presented here is um, very critical to not only document as Dr. Tanisha Watkins brought up, but we have to continually educate and bring in that awareness from every element in our community, faith-based nonprofits, the city, municipality with officials, and in our educational school systems, we must begin to also not only make them feel welcome, as Jarquez brought up in his first response, but we also need to protect, making sure that no one feels as if they are going to be retaliated against when they are um, uh, being communicating or, or when they're communicating or participating in some form of advocacy. We really need protection and people need to feel like they're okay when they participate to support any form of advocacy. And again, it's something that's going to be a continual conversation because it goes deeper than that. Sure. So question number three says, throughout the country, we're hearing reports daily of police reform. What types of reform or new implementation ideas would you suggest to our Thomasville Police Department? And I'll open the floor up for folks to, to jump in and, and give us some feedback on that particular question. So I really value science and what um, data suggests is effective. And so when we think about what we can do, um, what policies that we can implement um, to reform Townsville Police Department, I think it's really important that we go to evidence-based practices. And so just from some of the research that I've looked up and that's out there, I think first and foremost, um, in regard to policing, I think that Thomasville Police Department, if they don't do it already, we need to make sure that we are incorporating some racial bias assessment for all new hires, and we need to do routine assessments for all current um, individuals who work within our police departments. That way we can identify on an individual basis um, where people are and then create some specific training for them. Um, also, I think that we need to emphasize in Thomasville as well as countrywide um, training that teaches de-escalation and violence as a last resort and teaching to shoot to eliminate the threat um, instead of to kill. Um, I think, um, you know, um, in, in simulations, 
it's, it's hard to kind of think through your training, but if we can make trainings more stimulated to real life and we can show people how their bias may be impacting their decisions, it may um, help them the next time they are in a real life situation. Um, and then lastly, I just think that local police departments should um, have specific committees that handle all police complaints. I think right now, one of the things that we feel um, in Thomasville is that, oh yeah, I can make this complaint, but it's not really going to go anywhere. So if we can have an objective committee um, that is not necessarily on the side of the police or on the side of the community, but on the side of truth, then it will help us to build that trust, transparency, and accountability that we need within our police department. This is Jane Murphy. Can I, is it okay for me to go? Yep, sure. Um, I, I will let you know that um, it came up in our conversation this past Sunday night, um, to our Monday night, I can't believe I remember when that was, sorry. So um, we all need to look into the enforcement policy that our police department uses. And so we already have, I've already requested that, a copy of that, and we actually are going to have that on um, our committee to look into what the enforcement policy says for Thomasville, um, and then make that available to everybody in the city so they'll know exactly what it says. I also think that um, we need to get past um, for the whole community, if that if I'm not in charge of something, that I'm not going to get involved. And I know this backs up to, to probably the question before us, but um, there is a lot of, I want to be in charge, but not enough of sometimes the people that want to follow. And so we, we have kind of have a segregation in our whole city that if I'm not the leader, I'm not going to get involved with certain things. And I think that's, that's discouraging, and I hope that we can get past that. You preaching, Jane. Sorry, but I am. All right, well, listen, I appreciate it. Uh, I want to allow Marlene, I know she has spoke up earlier, to uh, comment. Marlene, you can go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, so one point that I, I'd really like to make is that as of right now, I feel like the Thomasville Police Department puts a lot of um, emphasis on looking at crime through the crime control model instead of focusing on crime prevention. And um, I think that we also need to make sure that we're emphasizing because crime prevention is, is really, really important. And what I mean by that is that we need to make sure that we have strong ties with the police department, you know, and instead of like patrolling uh, very harshly the areas, you know, in the center of Thomasville where we have a strong Hispanic and black community, you know, we need to make sure that we're creating ties with the police, the police department. Personally, me, I know I've already talked about personal experience, but um, I've also had a very unprofessional run-ins with our police department. I had one instance where it was a traffic stop and um, you know, the officer did like hold his gun and you know, it, it was a very, very scary moment. He also stuck his tongue out. I complained, but did my complaint any go, uh, go anywhere? I'm not sure. The, what I'm trying to get at with this is I'm trying to get at the point that a lot of the times we think these things don't happen here in Thomasville, but we do have those issues here in Thomasville. And it's very, very important for us to be able to feel like the police department is actually here to protect us, not just to make sure that we're not committing crimes. Um, again, I'm Jackie Jackson. And um, a couple of things I wanted to um, bring forward is, um, I think there needs to be, um, some process or some way to provide an incentive for people to say something specifically within the police department because um, my guess is is that somebody knows that person is racist somebody knows how that person feels but that person isn't saying something he and, and i feel like it goes back to um what we were taught in elementary school when if you see something say something um because that right there starts the the process of breaking it down and, and preventing it because therefore if I see it happening because I know that person then I have I should at least try to feel comfortable to say something to that person if we're friends now I can say if if it's somebody that you know yes but you know, and if it's somebody that you don't know, I think that becomes a challenge. But within the, the police department specifically, 
those police officers know which ones are making racial slurs. They know which ones are um, in the locker room making those type of comments. That's where it needs to be um, addressed and hit head on then, coming from someone they know. Um, that's the first thing. And the second one is um, I wanted to kind of talk about and throw it out is that I've heard it before, a citizen review panel. It came up a lot. I, was, I served on the city council in the city of Richmond, Virginia, which is the capital of Confederacy. So you can imagine what we dealt with there. Um, but that citizen review panel is, that, is an opportunity for those type of issues and concerns coming from the community not to fall on deaf ears. Now, the challenge with the citizen review panel is getting the right people on that panel. Now, a part of that is, you know, how do you identify who should be on it? Um, I think uh, it was Dr. Watkins that mentioned, um, you know, doing some type of, you know, a racial test on people, but that's a way to get um, insight and input from the community, um, looking at those panels to deal with those type of um, issues when they're brought forward from the police department specifically. Absolutely. Thank you for that insight, Jackie. Anyone else want to touch on this particular question? Okay. Um, Huey, you you're talking, but you're not unmuted. I got you. I got you. I got you. Hey, so really quick, I want to go back to question two for two seconds. And I just want to tell Jaquez how much I absolutely love him, his youth, his vibrance, and what he's doing. Um, I, I called him out in a city council forum that I sat through, I guess it was almost three years ago. And I, I don't know that I could be any prouder of anybody on this call than him. Jacquez, I love you and I love your heart. Um, and I wanna go back to the fact that when we were talking about programs within the community, I had actually made the suggestion when I was running for council that we needed to start a mentor program. But I don't think it needs to be something that's just geared towards the city school. Drew, you and I had a very candid conversation about you not you being taught not to get on the elevator with a with a white girl, and we had this conversation the other day. Um, and it, because of what you've been taught, and then compared to what she had been taught, and so I'm, I'm, I'm again, it's key that um, the education is the biggest part. So I think that starts with mentoring. And instead of like our schools, like Jacquez had said about Davidson County, I said that and think that instead of looking at them as arch rivals in every single sport, that we start to embrace the fact that we, we're all from here. Um, point three, um, the policing program, whatever you want to call it, as far as what we need to do, uh, as far as it, with that, I, I actually had a conversation with Jackie today um, it blows my mind when I, I sat back. Sorry about that. I have an eight-year-old. That's the reason I was late getting on the call in the first place. Um, but I, I think part of this starts and it comes back to I, when we have this conversation, I don't even know how many of us really on here even work inside the city of Thomasville. And I still think that a lot of this comes down to the economy. I think that even the policemen that take jobs here, look at this as a stepping stone for the next thing. And most of the people that get promoted through the police department look at it as the good old boy system. So that's the reason nobody does that. So as far as I'm a huge advocate of having, I don't want to say that you're policing the police, but I am an absolute huge advocate of having a checks and balances set in place that if there is some form of complaint that comes through, that it doesn't just get brushed under the rug. Um, I think that's why we're in the shape that we're in now. I mean, you go back through the, the Chauvin guy that, that we're even having these conversations about, this guy had gotten in trouble 18 times and the police chief kept him on. I don't know why. I don't know if he was, that's part of the good old boy system, but I think that's where that starts to get eliminated. So I know I, I, I tried to do good, stay under three minutes, but that's, that's just my take. I think that we need to have something in place to where we keep track of what's going on because in the bottom line, with skin color, it, that's that's what all this is about but we're still all people and we're still friends and we're family and everything else and and that's just where I'm at with it yeah no snitching don't only apply in the street but it also applies on in the police force and so those are some areas that definitely needs to be addressed I think promoting uh, 
a more diverse um, police presence. So more black and brown uh, representation uh, on the police force. And a part of being able to do that is um, the police building better relationships with the community. Um, we've, we've engaged in some work over my time at Emmanuel or in leadership at Emmanuel to strengthen the relationship. And we saw some, some fruitful uh, benefits of that. But I think two things. One, we spearheaded those efforts, not the police department, in partnership with uh, Chief Inslee at the time. Um, and so I think there has to be more uh, effort from the police department to um, find out what, what they can do uh, in order uh, to, to improve their relationship with folks in the community. Yeah, um, as far as the, it's just getting, I think getting to know our police officers also. I'll be honest with you, uh, I see a lot of them around town, but I, I, don't, I don't know them personally. Um, so as uh, an individual and uh, as a citizen, it's important for me to, to get to know our police officers. Also, I would like to see more police officers, um, especially downtown on foot, um, just to build relationships with our, our, our community. Uh, a lot of times it's just they're either parked or just driving by, but I would like to see our police officers more in our communities, um, be getting involved with community service also other than apart from also just doing the beat. And that's it. So question number four, question number four, give one way you can suggest that we take steps toward reform and addressing situations of discrimination, racism, or prejudice within Thomasville. The difference between this question and the last question, we need you to answer, again, from your sphere of influence, if you can. From your sphere of influence, and again, we have college students on here, so we want you to speak, again, from the school system, if you would, but as the other panelists speak, and please speak from your sphere of influence. Uh, let's start with Ms. Um, Jane Murphy. I'm thinking, sorry. Um, I would like to even see more participation. Um, I know that sometimes our city council meetings or our city committee meetings are not always um, subjects of excitement for community members, but the more that we can get everybody to be involved. So if we could have more people come and to share their input at a, at a committee meeting or at the city council meetings would also open an opportunity to strengthen those relationships um, moving forward as a city of one versus different groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pastor Jimmy Granger, give one way you can suggest we take steps towards reform and addressing situations of discrimination, racism, or prejudice within Thomas Field. Pastor Jimmy Granger. I have to speak from the church's perspective. Um, and uh, me and Pastor McNair mentioned, talked a little briefly about this the other night. It's important that uh, for especially white churches to, and the orchard specifically, it's important for us that we have a black pastor in our church um, to give, uh, to be a voice uh, where I'm be, maybe ignorant of. So I think those are just steps that we can do as churches our church is, is, is um, biracial. I have uh, biracial kids, grandkids, I mean, and uh, nephews and nieces. Uh, so our family is a, a multitude of color, beautiful color. But for our, to, to really have for us to, to, to be an effective uh, voice too in our community, it's important for us to begin to have leaders that we, we raise up uh, of color mm -hmm. in our churches. Uh, to, to offer opportunities to, to minister. Um, we, we feed our city every third Saturday of the month, have been almost for almost 10 years. And we've been looking for opportunities to not only do it once a month, but in other areas of our city. So it's important that we, even though we feed downtown Thomasville, that we get out into other areas and other communities to, for our face to be seen. 
and to build relationships with those other communities other than just downtown Thomasville. Okay, thank you for that, um, Pastor Granger. Um, Marlena, if you'd like to go next, please. One suggestion, give one suggestion. And again, that's addressing discrimination, racism, or prejudice within Thomasville. How would you reform that? Well, I definitely think that the students in Thomasville, um, Thomasville High School specifically, um, should be able to voice more of like their opinions and concerns and maybe like their voice needs to be reached out into the other uh, schools in Davidson because we are all still Thomasville. And I think that, you know, change and major movements all throughout history have always started with our youth. So I think it's really, really important to get the young generation involved in these changes and be able to hear their concerns, their voices and come together and, you know, make it known and make it heard. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Michael Brandt, would you like to pick up there? Just one way you can suggest steps towards reform or addressing these situ situations. As a member of the city government, I think that what we can do is work harder to make sure that opportunities for city jobs are known in various communities in, the, in within the city uh, within the city itself, so that we can start to build a more diverse uh, workforce. Uh, our workforce doesn't have to equate exactly to the, the different races that are within our community, but they should be represented. And, and I believe that there are opportunities within our hiring practices to make adjustments and, and try to strive for that uh, effort. Thank you so much. Dr. Sheraton Love, Dr. Sheraton Love, if you would please. So I'll speak from an area that I'm heavily involved in, which is nonprofits. Um, I know from a community or, excuse me, a county perspective, a lot of our nonprofits work together and coordinate, especially when you're thinking about uh, families that might need help in, in multiple areas. Um, I think nonprofits can make sure, first off, that they have missions and values and goals that address um, discrimination in a community, racism in a community, and then their actual actions that they go through. How are we working together to make sure that um, we're not only giving uh, families what they need on the short term, but we're all working together to build a long-term um, process of success for families. And, and we have a lot of great nonprofits in the area that are doing that. Um, I can shout out a lot of them um, here locally. CCM does that. I'm on the board of Davidson County Community Action. There are a lot of nonprofits that think long-term about how do we help um, raise families out of poverty, but, but continue to help them. You know, how do we help them thrive and things like that are systemic racism you know who are the families that are struggling and think about from a broad perspective of why that is so they have to have a concerted coordinated effort to call that out first off um, and then work together to make sure that we're lifting up families uh, and helping them thank you thank you um mr jacques johnson and then after that dr tanisha Watkins, if you would pick up please and then ja from Jaquez, Dr. Watkins, and Pastor Huey. Jackie Jackson, if you would like to bring that up from the rear. Um, again, Jaquez next, Dr. Watkins, Pastor Huey, and Jackie Jackson. Well, I'll speak on the uh, student standpoint. As students, we have the opportunity, we have the obligation to speak up and to understand that our voices have power. And if you're scared and afraid and like, well, I don't think it's my time, or people tell you that it might be older than you that it's not your time, ask yourself, then when is the time for you to begin to speak up? Understand that your voice has power, and our voice goes even more when we take it to the ballot box. When we take those things to the ballot box and we hold our elected officials accountable for their actions and elect good people in positions so that we can truly move forward. That's how we as young people we as student leaders and we as young activists can move our community forward in a way that we want to see. And we want to have our future for our future kids and even grandkids is by making sure that we use our voice and then we use our voice in that ballot box in November and we vote and we vote uh, educatedly um, and Um, so I have two recommendations. Um, so 
I think one of the first things I would encourage everyone or every organization to do is to reevaluate or to look at their policies and procedures and ask themselves how are these goals um, inclusive of all different types of races, ethnicities, and sexual orientations. So racism and discrimination, as we know, it's very subtle and it can be nuanced, right? And so one of the things that we can do, again, is to look at things from an organizational um, perspective and to look at our policies and are those policies written in a way that make people feel welcome and included. And then I, looking at my sphere of influence as a consultant, um, I think a lot of times we don't even know the gems that we have in our backyard, right? Um, I know a lot of people in this particular area who are, you know, um, activists, advocates, um, who have PhDs and who are experts on certain areas, but I feel like the community overall is not utilizing their expertise. So as a consultant or an expertise, I would just recommend that people be bold enough to um, reach out to these organizations directly, such as our police departments and say, hey, this is what I know. This is what I've studied for the past couple of years. I have some recommendations that I think can better help you in your reforms. I don't see Huey, so I'll reclaim his two minutes, his three minutes. <laughs> Um, so the steps that I think that, um, that I can do and that we also need to do, um, I have three things that we need to focus on. Um, focus on the number of police officers that look like us um, that are in the police department. So there are requirements to, to become a police officer. And I think that we need to begin to help our young people to make sure that they can fall in line to stay um, viable candidates for a police officer. Um, a lot of times we're getting um, overlooked or left out because, of course, our backgrounds and criminal history that prevents us from being on the police department. So that's a specific step in trying to increase the number of police officers in the, um, the local force. Same thing, let's take it a step further, the number of teachers that look like us. Um, each of us can remember there are certain teachers that we connected with when we were in school, and primarily we connected with them because they look like us. Um, so I think that's very important. We kind of started that a little bit at the high school when we had Mr. Beeman there as the principal. We were having issues with our young boys. So we made it a, an intentional effort to try to get male teachers in the school system to deal with our black boys. So we need to make sure that we are taking specific steps to try to get teachers in the school system from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade that look like the kids that they are teaching because that is a step of um, engaging and building relationships with our students. And then finally, the number of elected officials that look like us. Um, if, if, if each of us can identify people that can be viable candidates to run, we need to help them run. We need to be able to give them um, the steps that they need to do to run. A lot of times when we run, we always as black candidates get the, the typical response that if it's more than us running, that we're splitting the black vote. And every time people say that, I'll always come back and ask, well, why aren't y'all splitting the white vote? Because it's more of y'all running. Um, and no one can ever answer that question. So um, I think those are three specific areas that if we focus on, we can begin to attack the racism and prejudices. Okay, great. Dr. Uh, Andrew, if you would go ahead, please, and we can move forward. Uh, I was just going to add, we can't, I think um, when, when talking about reform, and I'm thinking specifically back to the police reform, uh, I think we have to also talk about mental health reform. Um, oftentimes, folks would benefit so much more from engaging with a mental health professional um, rather than a police officer. Uh, in moments of crisis. And so uh, we have very little uh, resources, um, mental health resources in the city. And so I'm, I'm 
my other personality uh, is a clinical social worker um, out at North Carolina a and uh, So I have pretty, pretty broad experience in the mental health field. And uh, I, I think it's super important for, for our city um, to look at how we can increase accessibility uh, and uh, resources uh, to, to mental health um, in this city. Uh, so we would like to thank you all so much um, for joining us. That's going to do it for us tonight. And again, Pastor McNair, if you would, thank you so much for the platform. And we are just excited to have been a part of the conversation. We're going to turn it back over and yield to you to close us out. Yeah, before, um, before we uh, wrap, wrap that up, I want to um, just allow because we do have, this is for the city of Thomasville, I wanna allow um, Jane and Michael Brandt um, to uh, just give some, some final thoughts and maybe some things that um, they feel is already in the works or just, just some things from a, uh, the city level. And then Jaquez um, with his ear to the ground in our community and, and our youth um, to just give us some final, final thoughts. Uh, this is something that we're not going to let drop, that we have to all work together. And I think that our next conversation, we really need to involve the police department, representatives from the police department. If we think that um, there may be issues there or we need to help build those relationships, they definitely need to have a voice at the table. So I would recommend that we um, include them on the next conversations. I would like to say that uh, I appreciate being involved with this group and with others in, in Thomasville. And the past weeks have caused us to think very hard about what is going on in our country. And I've been very pleased to see that there's been um, a lot of, uh, of multi-ethnic multi groups that have been standing up to the activities of the uh, police officers and are marching together. I, we saw it the, uh, just yesterday in Thomasville with a small group of young students and, and uh, young adults that led that. Uh, and I think that has to continue. This cannot, this issue of racism and systematic racism uh, cannot be solved by one group. It has to be all of us working together and recognizing that there are going to be times when we're going to step on each other's feet because good intention people sometimes say the wrong things and recognize that it's coming from a place of moving forward. And yes, uh, maybe we should have been here 10 years ago. Maybe we should have been here one year ago, but we're here now and we can move together forward if we continue to work for it. Let's also keep in mind that this movement is bigger than us. It's for our future generations and in order for us to, to move together, we have to remember that we have to do it in unity and in love for our nation, our community, and we have to do this um, arm by arm. Um, with our brothers and sisters from all different colors. And it's just been so heartening to be on the ground in the protests and seeing people of all races, um, all religions, um, sexual orientations, and just coming together in a common call to move our community forward. So thank you. Again, thank all of you. Um, shout out to um, Pastor Drew and Shelly for leading our conversation and our panel today. Thank you guys for taking time out of um, your schedule. Um, look, looking forward to us doing this physically one day. I don't know. I don't know when that day gonna come, but um, hopefully we all can sit down together. Me and Pastor Granger, we we broke the uh, social distancing code and we came we came together. We we actually felt that because of the sensitivity of the of the situation, we needed to we needed to sit down together um, and and allow people to see that. Um, but um, it, 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 time, time willing, we'll all be able to do this. And as Jane said, Jane, I, I know, I know you're gonna um, stick to your word, and you know I'm gonna stick to mine. We're gonna try to keep the conversation going, keep this going, keep it in front of 
our city. I said on a podcast the other day, I can't change the country, um, but I can try to help change the city. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the best we can do. I, I'm not worried about what's happening in DC. That's a, I can't I can't change the president. Um, but if we can change Thomasville, hopefully it'll spill over to Lexington. Hopefully it'll spill over to High Point. And then eventually we can we can have a better state and then that, that can go to the next state. So we're, right now we're we're focused on Chair City and, and making this um, a better a better place for each and every one of us. Whether we're whether whether you're a resident, whether you're an employee, uh, whether you're a student, whether you are a, a minority of any sort, black, Latino, um, either either way, we want this to be an equal opportunity city all around. Um, and I know that all of us on this Zoom, that's what we want. And I appreciate you guys for um, for taking that stance and making your voice be heard. Um, to those who are, are listening in. Um, continue to check out um, the City of Thomasville Facebook page for any more of these town hall announcements that we'll have. We'll try to keep this conversation going as much as possible. If you have any uh, ideas, please reach out to any one of us. Um, uh, join the uh, City Council meetings. Uh, Jane, you guys' meetings probably are not open to the public at the time, correct? We're doing Zoom meetings and all you have to do is call City Hall and um, speak to Wendy Martin and she'll be glad to give you the information to get on the Zoom. Okay, perfect. Everybody should join those. There's no excuse now. You can just click your, click your computer and, and jump in. So um, let's be a part of that conversation and let's change our city. So thank you guys. Y'all have a good night.